Thank you very much, Asit, Prasad, and Shantanu for that engaging discussion. Thank you, Prasad, for taking us through the details of how Dell Technologies and SISL have been instrumental in transforming Railtel to an ICT leader. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to bring in our next segment, the Innovation Diaries. It is widely accepted that innovation is the primary source of competitive advantage for companies in essentially all industries and environments. And it drives efficiency, productivity, and differentiation to fill a higher variety of needs. Industry today needs a productivity boost from innovation and new frontier technologies to support growth. How are technology innovators helping companies in introducing new ways of working and helping organizations navigate complex journeys to resilience and the ability to combat disruption? For this engaging conversation, please join me in welcoming Mr. Rupesh Gupta, the Director and Region Head, Data Center Solutions, North and West, Dell Technologies. Mr. Aman Tareja, Director Sales, Commercial and Enterprise, VMware. And our moderator for the session, Mr. Shantanu Ganguly, CEO, Strategic. I would now like to hand it over to Shantanu. Good day, everyone. This is Shantanu from Strategy. I'm back with you in today's uh, Innovation Diaries session, where we will have uh, technology solution-led business innovation conversation with eminent technology leaders uh, from the Indian industry. And we will discuss certain use cases, uh, success stories, industry vertical examples, and uh, all life in, in presence of our distinguished audience so that the audience can uh, imbibe, reflect upon, uh, evaluate certain possibilities, visualize certain opportunities, and then adopt appropriately where it makes uh, exponential business impact. So with that note, pleasure to welcome today, uh, Mr. Rupesh Gupta, Director and Regional Head, uh, North and West, Data Center Solutions, Dell Technologies. Welcome Rupesh. Thank you, Shantanu, and a warm welcome to all of you. And uh, also delighted to welcome Aman Tareja, Director Sales, VMware. Welcome, Aman. Pleasure Hi. to have you together with us. Thanks, gentlemen. And, and it's a privilege. Uh, thanks for taking out uh, time from your busy schedules today and then uh, for enlightening, uh, for agreeing to enlighten our audience today. So, uh, and then for our audience, uh, we have already uh, seen the, the Disruption Decoded session where our, our boardroom members shared certain highlights. So I'll start with a clue from there. And then this clue is uh, from Disruption Decoded where we discussed about uh, business organizations imperatives of very finely balancing old technology with new. And then that continuous need to protect what's working well for you, which is your core uh, technology infrastructure and, and, and at the same time uh, continuously evolving uh, in, in your digital journey and modernizing where it needs uh, to be modernized and where it delivers exponential business impact. So with that context, Rupesh, I would want to come to you that uh, tell us a bit about uh, how Dell Technologies is enabling our customers today uh, to modernize and innovate, say, with digital age technologies such as hybrid multi-cloud or uh, AI-enabled data monetization and, and secure digital automation uh, without destabilizing their core business operations and at the same time uh, evolving and modernizing for the future. All right. Uh, thanks, Antonio, for asking this question. Um, let me just try and uh, build context here uh, and the, the problem statement. See, disruption is needed, but it can't be at the cost of ongoing technology and business operations. The key success factor here is to scope it well, plan it well, and execute it well. And the right partners who understand the environment challenges are the right folks who will execute it well. Let me talk about AI here. According to a recent study by Forrester, organizations are either using or planning to use today's AI for use cases such as improving IT efficiencies, mitigating 
compliance risks, gaining better customer insights, delivering a better customer experience, and many more. Every organization has a unique approach to how they implement and derive value out of AI. But regardless of, of how organizations chart the course through the data era, there is a little question that to thrive, they must become digital, organ digital organizations powered by data and running into multi-cloud world. Those organizations who align themselves to the value of data capitalize on the power of AI and evolve their businesses in new and differentiated ways to outpace their competitors. Those who do not, do not will lag behind. We are one of the pioneers in the hybrid cloud technology and workload optimization to me is at the core of our solutions. Our latest servers, power servers and storage solution portfolio are purpose built for such workloads, not only from a, from a performance standpoint, but also to enhance, but also has enhanced security built in to protect your data. Awesome. I think uh, leveraging best of breed technologies, personalization and contextualizing it specific to one's business organization need, and then also taking a grounds up approach, uh, analyzing diverse needs of different workloads. I think I think with, with that as, as a key takeaway, I'll come to you, Aman, and I'll build on top of what Rupesh just mentioned. So while this approach uh, is, is very, very unique and high impact, uh, I would also bring in a few uh, points which from the Disruption Decoded session our CFO pointed about, which yeah. is about uh, this uh, changing times and world where there is a lot of unpredictability and ambiguity that overall as a business, uh, every organization is having to navigate. At the same time, they, they, they are uh, compelled to constantly innovate and uh, evolve as a digital native business and ecosystem. So how, uh, as per you, VMware is enabling customers towards uh, sort of uh, achieving this in a very balanced manner? Sure, sure. So uh, thank you, Shandru, for this very relevant question. And of course, uh, adding on to what Rupesh said, see, uh, across a wide range of industries, businesses today operate in a, in a very global 24 by 7, always connected uh, digital content world. Uh, in this virtual era, customers, partners, employees, Everyone, everyone expects information to be available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. COVID uh, brought in some kind of unpredictability, but I think it, it has also accelerated the rate of innovation. Um, it has changed the rate of innovation, I think, at a lightning speed. Uh, when I talk to so many customers about their uh, digital journey and their visions, what they had thought they will do about three years uh, away, they have kind of advanced it. And, and, and done it in six to nine months. Also, one very important thing which uh, I feel is that because of the elongated COVID period, it is now affirmed and very, very strongly accepted that IT is not a cost center, but IT is a business driver and enabler. And this has been proven over a period of last few months where seamlessly the consumers are still able to operate, buy, and even get support for what, what they want. Companies like Dell, companies like VMware, uh, various other companies uh, which, which help us enable this have been evolving their solutions also to make sure that uh, this delivery is always available. This is cutting across all industries, whether you, I, I just want you to think of yourself as a consumer. How do you want to consume healthcare now or how have you been consuming healthcare in last few months? How do you consume banking? How do you consume retail? I think the world is still going on and the world has not stopped. I believe that when the going gets tough, the tougher guys get going over there. And this is a great time for companies to really adapt, rethink, reimagine and implement new strategies. 
VMware uh, traditionally came in about 20 years ago. We were the ones who brought in virtualization to the compute and said that hardware can be agnostic for our customers. And today, VMware has, has embraced multi-cloud. So when we talk about multi-cloud, what it means is that a customer should have the ability to consume any native cloud, move across native clouds, or come back to an on-prem cloud, or go on to an edge or a telco cloud. Can we do that seamlessly? Yes, of course, we can do that with the VMware cloud solution. Uh, VMware also goes to the end user side, and there are various solutions which VMware provides, uh, like your unified endpoint management, a mobile device management, or your virtual desktop solutions, which can help your employees or your customers still access the whole solution gamut in a very seamless way. Now, on one side, we talk about the infra. On the other side, we've spoken about the consumption by the end user. But what drives this all or what is in the center of this is the workload. When I talk about workload, workload is applications, data. So VMware has brought in its Tanzu portfolio, which helps you adopt the microservices environment. And microservices really changes the game. Uh, just, just for example, let's uh, think about how do we watch TV? Yeah, we all used to watch TV with cable TV. We were happy with four channels, eight channels, 30 channels, 100 channels. And now we all move to a OTT operator kind of environment where Hotstars, Netflix of the world uh, give us this kind of flexibility to watch TV. And this has happened because of these modern solutions and the digital transformation journey which companies took. And this really helped them break apart from the pack and, and bring about change. As VMware, we also focus a lot on security side. And for us, security is intrinsic. We don't believe in a bolted on security. We believe in built-in security. Can we build in security at a virtual application level? Can we have security in our cloud journey? Can we have security in our um, endpoint solutions? Yes, we need security everywhere in an intrinsic format. So, I think I, I'm. I think I'm very fortunate that as as a VMware uh, salesperson, I can help customers on their transformation journey and address uh, solutions uh, across uh, various segments. Wonderful, Aman. And I think what you mentioned and summarized in a short span of time exactly resonates with what uh, our esteemed customer uh, from Railtail uh, affirmed uh, during the Profiles in Success session. So. They adopted Dell Technology solution overall as part of their uh, e-governance and digital workspace uh, program. And uh, given the, the, the richness and the, uh, I would say, unique uh, high impact uh, technology services support all combined uh, uh, by, by Dell Technologies uh, and uh, SISL Infotech, this customer, had a jump start uh, in terms of time to value. They, they had planned this project rollout for 12 months, which they could accomplish in six months itself. They started with by thinking about 50,000 customers who would be leveraging this ecosystem. It's now already grown to 1.5 lakhs users. Wow. And thirdly, uh, they are uh, launching new services now and across diverse lines of businesses, uh, pan enterprise to be able to uh, exponentially demonstrate real life value. Sorry, Rupesh, you had a point to add? Yeah, if I may add you know, to my, Aman's point, he mentioned a couple of data points which are very relevant, the how we consume banking today. And the other point it spoke about that due to the unprecedented times we got, all got into, uh, the, the speed of uh, digitization is, is actually happening at the speed of light. I think it is more of a forced one uh, many of us didn't realize. But there is an other merit from a, from a, our country standpoint is that our predictability, or our prediction on the average age is going to turn 25 by the, by the year 2026, right? That's what the data says, which essentially means that new and young generation who's already born in our digitized world will definitely have that. Now, we were talking to a couple of banks and they said that their plan to cut down the opening of branches yeah. in new cities have come down by half, which essentially tells that the money they're going to save 
in the form of you know, the expenditure they will have in real estate and setting up ATMs and bank branches and having employees physically deployed there, they will go, go and spend that money into digital. That's that's the broader part of it. And I think it's very, very exciting times. We as, as, as technology providers, we are also being forced to talk or rather invest more onto autonomy and security. And, and I, I, to Amun's point, I completely agree. Security is going to be, be at, at the core of whatever we are trying to do today. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, to, to move forward, uh, one, uh, I would say new angle dimension I would want to bring here is about the user experience and the people part of the, the business organization and, in, in, and, and about their uh, uh, experience of using, adopting technology and overall that uh, digital culture, uh, uh, digital mindset and possibly a larger digital DNA uh, being embedded into the business organization goes a long way towards uh, adoption of these cutting edge technologies, putting the uh, outcomes flow back into the business processes and then they, they deliver the impact and result which, which are required from a customer facing, revenue facing and result facing standpoint. So in that context, uh, maybe Rupesh, I would uh, seek your quick thought about how you think Dell Technologies overall uh, from a product solution uh, services standpoint uh, is, is uh, constantly innovating towards enriching and enhancing the user experience and adoption propensity part of it. Very, very relevant and uh, great question, Santanu. Uh, let me try and answer this in two parts. First of all, as, an, as a technology organization, we, and it was all across in public media that we invest more than $4.5 billion in R&D. And that's the spend we, we do every year in, in, in innovation and research and development. Now, for us, research is just not technology, you know, investing or innovating products in, from a technology standpoint, but it is also to understand the user behavior and delivering on expectations. What are user wants, how they, what are the challenges they face while managing our, our portfolio or what are the uh, real, real ex examples or uh, real life uh, situations they get into and what are the outcomes they expect. So we spend a lot of time around that. We capture customer feedback from hundreds and thousands of customers across the globe to decide and build an enhancement into our solutions. Let me talk, take a couple of examples Today, customers want automation and security. And these are the two topmost, I think, uh, priorities in any organization across the board without compromising on performance. So net net, what we are saying that you want performance, you want automation, and you want security. Let me talk about something which resonates with, with our server portfolio. So the, our recent a recently launched server portfolio called PowerEdge, internally we call it as 15th generation of servers. This is built on three key tenets, adaptive compute, autonomous compute infrastructure, and proactive resilience. Let me take a couple of them just to briefly talk about what auto autonomous compute infrastructure means here. We are building intelligent system that work together and independently enabling rapid digital transformation and productivity. What it essentially means is our vision is to not only provide rapid provisioning, that's what a core tenet of automation is, but also self-optimizing, self-healing. Say, for example, today we use, all of us have smartphones. Now, there's a push which keeps coming in. You, know, you need to update your software feature to for you to go and use A feature or B feature. What if it the phone knows my behavior pattern. It knows what software uh, version is for me and automatically updates that. So that's what self-healing and self-optimization is all about. And that's the vision we are heading towards. It didn't start it now. It, it has already started two generations back and that's where we are. We are building on to that capability as we progress into our new generation. The other part which is very relevant and we spoke in the previous question as well was on the security. Now, our security on, on the security on server platform 
we have built in is production through a complete portfolio of solutions right from the silicon root of trust and supply chain all the way to asset requirement what i mean by asset requirement is that tomorrow you want to retire a server you can do a system erase and nobody will be able to fetch the data even if you discard your server or sell that repurpose a server for some some other use use case brilliantly put adaptive autonomous and proactively secure and on that thread of proactive security maybe i'll uh, come to aman uh, on this point where uh, aman uh, again uh, basis conversation with a uh, couple of cios we spoke previously in our war room diary session uh, we see whereas uh, the vision of uh, maneuvering diverse workloads across multi cloud environments in, in and and this specific especially is relevant for large diverse multi location or multi lob enterprises uh, moving workloads across diverse cloud domains while while it's 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 a great vision it's a great promise uh, when it comes to operational execution uh, there are a few teething challenges of what you previously have versus what you are building uh, on, on top of it with new all those are i would say finer uh, granular considerations so uh, could you add a little here from vmware standpoint how vmware is trying to maybe standardize and set up a common minimum baseline to make this adoption and seamless movement of workloads uh, as much simplified sure so uh... at the beginning of this i think like, i i would like to accept what feedback the customers have given and it is certainly uh, it can be very challenging for customers to really uh, adopt into this new modern world of multi cloud uh, to remain so much relevant to the businesses and customers and uh, you know there are there are different organizations who focus on on the goal which they have to achieve or the service that they have to be de delivering to their customers for example a manufacturing company is so focused on the r&d of the manufacturing that for them workload movement multi cloud is is something which uh, which may not be the top of the list they may want to figure out which engine or what r&d they do over there so that their cars are the best or uh, even for example uh, nations governments right now we we need to reach out to the masses and and be able to deliver consistent services uh, to our citizens and a country like india for example is so vast in its geography and and culture and connectivity if i can say that it can be uh, mind boggling and and obviously these questions are absolutely right what customers are pointing out so Uh, coming on to what vmware has been doing on this and how do we solve this i would like to take a step back um what is at the core of vmware is that when servers came in or the compute came in vmware came with a technology called hypervisor which was able to virtualize the server or the compute power and help applications run faster and a uh, higher efficiency on the compute side vmware always made sure that customers had the ability to choose any compute and multiple compute platforms could work together seamlessly or multiple storage hardware platforms could work together seamlessly we have taken the same vision the same strengths that we had double down on our r&d efforts and brought this to the multi cloud world so what we have done is that now we work with all the csps whether it is azure whether it is aws whether it is oracle whether it is ibm or whether it is google and whether it is alibaba vmware sits at the center of it and helps customer move into a multi cloud journey without rearchitecting their applications without the need of changing their ip schema and i think the sweetest part is that they can do this without retraining their manpower as well so our solution yes. vmware cloud found so vmware cloud basically is a solution which works across any cloud 
and suppose a customer has adopted today uh, a solution on Azure's uh, CSP, and maybe after some time they also want to add on or move their workload to uh, AWS Cloud. This can happen very swiftly by a click of a button. This, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to make it as simple and as easy consumption uh, for our IT departments of our customer organizations. They don't have to relearn as to how this could happen. So we have created our instances of cloud with all the service providers. We've also done this with telcos. We've also done with a lot of edge uh, cloud providers and try to make it as consistent and as seamless possible. Um, I do remember one of uh, the financial companies, uh, they had their data center in uh, London. And last year, uh, post COVID, uh, they, had, uh, they were in a situation where they had to evacuate their data center. And they were so puzzled that how will we do that because we have multiple data centers and we have to move our workloads. And, and that data center without physical presence, they were not able to get the uh, best management on that. So what do we do and how do we go about it? Uh, we, we positioned our uh, VMware uh, uh, solution over there. We worked along with Amazon over there. We call it the VMware Cloud uh, VMC on AWS uh, kind of solution. And you will not believe it, Shantanu. Uh, the customer took just two weekends, Saturday, Sundays, to move on to a cloud solution and evacuate their data center. Because we don't want to change anything how the customer organization is consuming it uh, uh, from an IT management and operations perspective. So the, the layer which sits on your server, which virtualizes your compute, that same layer has been advanced into the capabilities of being able to move either on-prem or on cloud, depending on your regulations from a, a security or a nation perspective, or your business demands as to how it happens. So I think there are certainly a lot of solutions uh, which we can discuss more in detail, but I would like to say our customers that we are here to work with you to solve this problem of a mammoth task of moving to a multi-cloud journey. Uh, we have our services capabilities to help you uh, achieve that. We also kind of assure you SLAs. It's not just about like moving you there, but we maintain the SLAs also for you. So, uh, uh, of course, happy to talk in more detail about these solutions and how they can help you consistently and seamlessly adopt the multi-cloud journey. So brilliantly put. I think VMware's uh, pro proactive effort and then uh, market leadership towards uh, pre-building maximally all these multi-cloud integrations as part of their core design philosophy of offerings into the market makes uh, all these technologies are uh, very, very consumable off the shelf and in the shortest time to value. I think that's the biggest benefit that I see customers derive out of this portfolio. And of course, for any last mile uh, custom integration, there are certain, I would say, on, I would say customer specific or project specific services, which sort of complements that last 5%, 10%, 15% of the integrations. And okay, I can on that, Shaman. The partner ecosystem has also been evolving with this. Yes, so uh, they, they have evolved, they have services, they have manpowers. A lot of large companies like Wipro, CFI, IBMs, I mean, they all have this, uh, this strength of uh, helping customers in the integration services capabilities. And, and we work and invest with our partners uh, seamlessly to ensure that uh, it, it, its adoption is easier at a scale uh, also. Fantastic. I have an eye on the clock. So uh, very quickly, uh, my last uh, maybe point on today's uh, uh, Innovation Diaries uh, session is about uh, this very interesting topic of the future of work is hybrid. And I'll, I'll, I'll split this into two parts and uh, seek your views. Uh, so when I think and look at future of work and purely from a technology and then technology-led business uh, innovation angle. I Broadly, we can break it up into two parts. One is more on the data center side where it is more the backbone of the business, technology backbone. And the second aspect is more on the digital workspace side, which is more the front end uh, employee touching or user touching part of the business. So maybe to Rupesh, I'll request your quick point of view on uh, the future of work, how uh, 
do you foresee uh, the future unfolding from Dell technology standpoint? Thanks, Anjana, for a great question. And I think uh, the term WFH has evolved in the last two years or so, rather one and a half years or so. It used to mean work from home, but I think now it means work from hence, right? And which essentially tells us that you, you need to provide the ability to your end users to work from anywhere. With that, with that as, as a context, I think it's important that what, what relationship Dell and VMware carries, right, from a, from a research and development work. So we have a long history and we integrate pretty well uh, at a PG level. So our products are, or all the innovation which happens through works, integrates well with the VMware platform. And to give you a bit of context around that, how we are poised in the market, how we are delivering our promise to the market, 100% of the Fortune 500 companies and Fortune Global 100 companies use VMware and Dell. And Dell is one of the largest IT companies in the world delivering innovation, innovative technology and services. That gives you power to do more. We ourselves are one of the largest consumer. Our entire media stack is built on VMware, VDI, uh, VMware Horizon platform. And you know, we, we, it's not recent, we have been there on this platform for long now. And as we got into the unprecedented times last year, we were one of the organization, first organization to go and ramp up because the base was already there. So whatever additional employees we had to cover uh, with that VDI stack or providing the VDI uh, image, uh, uh, the workloads, it was done without any much of the effort. The only effort was to go and supply, ship the laptops to, to the end user at their homes or wherever they're staying. The other, other aspect which comes very, very handy for us is with all of that integration which you see at, at the at the end user level, we also went and de developed some of the, how the user experience can change, which essentially means that you create personas. I'm a salesperson, what data is rele relevant for me? So our ID teams work, you know, I think in the right direction with respect to that whatever rela the data, which is we are, we are a large organization with a lot of, you know, infrastructure offering to, to offer. I mean, I would take two hours to go, go and keep on going on talking about what that overall portfolio. But having said, what as a user, what relevant data I can capture. So we created different personas so that the end user experience is met and the the navigation becomes easier. Because if you're in office, obviously you need, you have people around, you can ask your colleague sitting in the next cubicle about a lot of information, which is not possible today. So how to make it more easy. And the third largest piece, which is that, how do we go and in, integrate into the data center? Making a disruptive change in the way things are consumed. True. So that's a great uh, global success story. Aman, you want to add something to this? Yes, absolutely, Shantru. So uh, VMware has also been thinking around this topic and we have a lot of solutions which, which al already existed, uh, which helped customers to work from anywhere. We always believed in this even five years ago and, and were wanting to kind of drive the any device, uh, any, any location kind of uh, strategy for work. So uh, in May this year, we, we further kind of developed a solution which we called um, Anywhere Workspace. So basically something to address on the queries which some of the, the customers asked you about the seamlessness, consistency, security. Uh, what we believe is that there are three elements for any remote working. One element is your endpoint management, the virtualization of the endpoint, the experience of the endpoint, right? The second element is security. Whilst this happens, how do we really ensure security is on top of it and protection is provided? The third part is the connectivity. So it is like, how do, so you and me are working from home and we are no more on a IP MPLS network of our company, but we are using the internet and, and trying to log into the data centers and trying to work. So very, very unique and innovative solution of VMware, which is called Anywhere Workspace combines all these three elements it combines the VMware Workspace ONE, it combines the VMware Carbon Black Security Cloud, and it also adopts the VMware SASE architecture, which is a secure access service at SD-WAN solution. And the customer need not bother that I have to buy three licenses or three solutions and integrate it. They just buy VMware Anywhere Workspace and they get all these capabilities at one go. 
Fantastic. I think I think uh, very compelling value from a, a customer uh, standpoint. So uh, yes, Rupesh. Yeah, I think there's another data point which is very important, relevant with all of those technologies we adopted as an organization, including SD WAN, Velo Cloud SD WAN. The the in-house capabilities also brought us and how do we go and support our customers with that with that thought process in mind. Today we have more than 800 VMware certified engineers globally who support our customers on their journey towards VMware. But we have one side, our integration, tight integration at, at a PG level with VMware, where a vCenter can, can manage our infrastructure without any third con second console. Same time we have the fleet of engineers and experts, SMEs, who understand the VMware architecture pretty well, and they know how to break this, fix it. So I think that comes as a package in terms of an end-to-end -end approach and the thought process we have for our customer in the industry and the market to go and support our customer from an end-to-end -end standpoint and not, not only just talk about a point and solution and walk away from, from, from the data center. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks Rupesh, thanks Aman, I think. Uh... Uh, this has been a great conversation in today's uh, Innovation Diary session uh, with such lucid uh, use cases, success stories, uh, solution examples, uh, market thought leadership, uh, capabilities uh, oriented discussion we all had. And I'm sure to our audience, uh, it has been immensely beneficial with uh, about inspiring them, about provoking thoughts in their minds as to how some of these cutting edge technologies and solution sets can uh, get implemented, adopted in their organizations, in their industry verticals, in diverse forms and shapes, in diverse uh, consumption patterns of multi-cloud and, and, and still give them the flexibility, simplicity of <clears throat> maneuverability of uh, I would say seamless integrations, embedded, uh, grounds up, secure, uh, uh, I would say security capabilities being integrated uh, as, as part of the product design and so on and so forth. So uh, to our audience, uh, that was Innovation Diaries and uh, I'm sure uh, by this time of uh, the boardroom Unplug session today with Disruption Decoded, uh, War Room Diaries, uh, Profiles in Success, and now with Innovation Diaries, you have had a brilliant exposure in the shortest possible time to diverse thought processes, rich conversations, points of views, experience sharing, and uh, hope we could all collectively give you a <clears throat> great glimpse of practical examples, insights, and adoption, uh, uh, I would say, use cases. So stay tuned, uh, we, we will be back with you shortly for our next session, which is Leadership in Focus. And thanks, Rupesh, Avan, once again for joining us today in Innovation Diaries. Thanks, An thanks, Antanu, and uh, to all, all the audience, and good times ahead. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rupesh, Aman, and Shantanu. That was a thought-provoking technology solution-led business innovation discussion with many great takeaways. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we'd like to bring in our next segment titled Leadership in Focus. Through this segment, our intention is to hold a wide set of discussions with eminent personalities to understand their perspectives, learn from their experiences and viewpoints on various facets of technology and life. The personality joining us for this conversation has been teaching innovation at the Sikmal Alternative School where together with the students, he's designed and built solar heated buildings that are low cost, made of earth or mud and maintain a plus 15 degree temperature when the outside temperature is a minus 15 degree in winters. In order to solve the water crisis facing mountain regions due to climate change and the fast melting glaciers, he's invented the ice stupa artificial glacier, which stores the waste stream waters in winters in the form of giant ice cones or stupas and releases the water in late springs as they melt, just when the farmers need water. Please join me 
in welcoming our celebrity speaker for the day, Mr. Sonam Wangchuk, an eminent innovator and environmentalist who is in conversation with Ms. Ritu Gupta, Director of Marketing, Dell Technologies. Welcome back. Uh, I'm sure you've enjoyed our first two episodes. I'm very interesting insights and views shared by Mr. Wangchuk, who's our guest uh, speaker today. Uh, as we start with our third episode now, uh, one question to you, Mr. Wangchuk, and I know this is a topic which is very, very close to your heart and you, and you do uh, believe in this very strongly, and that is about technology and progress uh, and, and sustainability kind of going hand in hand. So if I have to elaborate on my question, we, we do know that, you know, positive prosperity overall must come with a positive impact to people's lives. And how do you see that going hand in hand in a manner that technology can help us build not just a prosperous and resilient future overall um, for our children, but as well as for our ecosystem? Uh, how do you see that going? So yes, uh, for the betterment of everybody, um, all living beings, Bahujan Sukai, Bahujan Hitai, um, on this planet, which is a Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So it's a family that we are living in. We should look at our planet as that. And in that uh, planet, we have to use technology to make it better for everyone, not just for me, my family, my country, nor for just human race, but for all our siblings in the wild also. So all living forms and non-living forms, the landscapes, the beauty of this planet, as long as our technology helps improve it, we are successful. But if our technology only helps a segment of it, for example, humans only, or me, myself only, and harms others, then I think we should have the wisdom of choice not to go for such technologies. Otherwise, technologies can do miracles. For example, even to live a happy life, you know, Edison invented the light bulb, which revolutionized life, but it was the incandescent bulb, which took so much energy. So some 30, 40 years ago, if you remember, all these electric bulbs illuminated our life into the night, but to get that light, we had to burn so many coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, and so on. It was important, but it took a lot of resources. So technology, both uh, you know, IT and other technologies together, researched and came out first with you know um, these uh, uh, lamps, these efficient lamps and uh, we have now leds light emitting diodes earlier it was the other kind which are like 20 times more efficient than edison's bulb so technology can do the same thing in such little resource that all these coal fired plants i'm sure could be closed down or put to other uses thanks to good wise application of technology. Similarly, you now have not just coal-fired plants, but solar power, which is again reducing the impact on nature. But then it should not be only about, you know, unbridled desire for more and more in our lives and not about efficiency and optimization. So technology can again help us in this. It doesn't help if solar panels are used in such scale that you know we don't look at reducing the need and use of energy at all. So even solar technologies, you know, panels do a lot of uh, harm to the planet. They can pollute when they go you know, uh, they retire and they become garbage. So again, technology, especially IT, 
can be used as uh, our binoculars. Like I said, man is a tool making animal. So we invented binoculars to look at very far places that we want to go. And you can use this binoculars to see and say, I want to go there or to see and say, I don't want to go there. It's not the right path. So similarly, I think technology should be put to use to project what we cannot see or imagine with our ordinary mind. So use this tool of the mind to project what happens if even harmless looking photovoltaic panels are so scaled up that finally, if you look at, it may be visible that this alone can cause a huge problem. I wish the people who invented the internal combustion car had these binoculars to see and say that, no, I see way into the 90s and 21st century, the same thing causing a lot of destruction on the planet. So we better change it. You know, um, some hundred years ago, we had a great choice of going for um, fuel, fossil fuel for our cars or electric. So electric cars are not new. They were in the 1800s also. If we had the binoculars of technology back then, we might not have chosen um, IC engine. We might have gone on the electric vehicle EV path 200 years ago, rather than doing it now so late. So I think technology also has these power like binoculars to eyes, bicycles for our movement, the same effect to look far into the future and say, we want to go there, we don't want to go there. So that's how I think technology should be put to use rather than only in maximizing production and consumption. And then uh, in the process, the planet, you know, suffers. So again, you're emphasizing about the, the wisdom of choice that rests with the humankind and with man taking, to see how technology- help of this tool to make choices of wisdom. Without this tool, without technology, we might even with wisdom make wrong choices. So use this tool is what I would say. Very well, very well. Uh, taking our discussion forward, sir, if I look at the last 15 odd months, um, you know, the whole concept of collaboration and meeting and working together has completely been redefined. We're no longer sitting in the same geographical spaces as in the offices or wherever, you know, common work areas, uh, but everything has become digital. We are also conversing, you know, on a digital platform. And the beauty is that, yes, you are there and joining us from Ladakh. I'm here in Bangalore and, and we are still able to connect, but that is how it has become. Everything has become digital. And I would probably go to the extent of saying that digital everything has become the, you know, has, has really become the new mantra. So in this entire space and this era of digitization, when everything is becoming very digital, how do you think we can build on this transformation and inspire our leaders of today and tomorrow, especially in this digital era? Yes, so as you rightly said, for me personally, it has been such a blessing that this new uh, way of life has become or taken importance now. It was there, but it was not seen as viable, etc. You know, I used to have to come from Ladakh every time to different cities in India or around the world. And I always used to feel so guilty that I'm having to make air travel to talk about environment. <laughs> this has this has really amazingly freed me. And this is a great example of how technology can be used for impact, for sustainability, for the good of everyone. Um, since I 
work in the field of education. Again, uh, this uh, pandemic, which has had this side effect of underlining more efficient ways of doing business uh, has been a great blessing, great blessing for me. I'll just give an example. I used to go to education conferences, schools, meet teachers, principal, parents, and so on, and would say that, uh, you know, the schools should adopt a new um, way of working. Things have changed around us. You know, schools have been a place where children go to listen to lectures from these professors. And I used to be not able to convince them that these lectures, if that was education, then there are so many lectures on the digital online world, much better than the teacher you could hire who may have some knowledge, but maybe not the best communicator in the world so that the lessons become memorable for the students. 10 times better lectures are all on internet and students anyway, watch those and learn. And when they come to the school, they have nothing new to learn from the teacher because they have cleared their concepts from YouTube and so many other platforms. So then they would start becoming a nuisance because they already know and have seen lectures 10 times better than your teacher. So they would cause problems and teachers would always say, these days the students are so misbehaved, they don't respect time, they don't respect teachers. And I would say my sympathies are with the students because they get so many beautiful lectures from around the world, the best in the world with 3D illustration. Why would they want to listen to your lecture? And then they can cause all such nuisance that you speak about. Instead, the role of schools should change. You know, don't stop them from the online world, help them use the online world. In fact, outsource all lectures and concept building to the online world and make schools do what it can do best. Schools don't need to close just because there are some platforms there. Schools can now do what they actually were the best place to do and what is missing and what can never happen online or uh, digitally. And that is application application of those concepts in real life. So there can be 100 lectures on capillary action, okay? But how to use capillary action to fill water in a discarded tire and tube and make plants grow in desert can only be done in a place where children come and collaborate with each other, have the human touch, and the teacher is the facilitator. So application of that knowledge can only happen in schools and therefore make schools into the action laboratories that it was meant to be and could be and let the lectures be outsourced to this wonderful digital world. So that's how I see uh, with this digital world, so many interesting things can be done in teaching, in medicine, there is telemedicine revolutionizing everything. Workplace has changed. We don't have to travel all that much. And yet, while attending to you know, family without polluting the environment, you can do so much. So I would say we should embrace, adopt, and use the time saved for more important things. Like in the case of schools, I said, what was missing in our education system was how to apply in life and how to solve problems. So this future school will not do lectures, will outsource lectures and will do things to solve problems and every child comes out as a doer. You can imagine what this uh, country can become and what this world can become. So that's what I hope and believe that uh, technology and this uh, new trend will do to our lives. And that, that's, that's going to be the foundation for the leaders of our future, for the leaders of tomorrow.
that that we will have in the country. Um, interesting. Um, as we wrap up, one one last question to you, and that is, uh, you know, we we you we've spoken a lot in detail, and you've shared a lot of uh, your views with us today. As uh, Sonam Bangshuk, the innovator and the education reformist, let's now take a peek at uh, the, the person behind all of this, which is you yourself, uh, Sonam Bangshuk. How what how how do you keep yourself um, engaged outside of workspaces? How do you find the time to pursue some passion areas which should which could be outside the outside the the work? And what are those passion areas for you? Okay, so interesting question. Uh, people have asked me as yes, my hobbies and what I do on weekends and so on. Somehow I feel that you need weekends and you need hobbies when you are in a situation when where you have to do things you don't really love to do or it's not the best refreshing thing for you, very important for them. But if you make the right choices and if you are in the field that you are passionate about, I think you do not need a weekend or a break or a hobby to take you away. So in my case, what I have, what I'm doing is what I chose. I didn't have to choose a different thing and then take a break from it. So it's very important that you make the right choices. So for me, there, I mean, why do you take breaks to refresh yourself? Uh, my work is so refreshing that uh, any break would actually break that refreshingness. So I really, my work is my hobby, uh, except, except when you have to do some administrative things that you really didn't mean to, like accounts and, uh, you know, the work with people who have things that you don't want to be spending your time on, then yes, I would need a break but otherwise on weekends or even on weekends when you go for something so-called interesting i am often seen taking a break and uh, thinking of my own solutions and problem solving which is what really uh, is uh, energizes me so i take breaks from the break to do what i normally do which is um, finding solutions to various problems using simple uh, methods. So, sorry, nothing exciting or interesting, but it is uh, a different way of seeing it. Oh, definitely. When your passion becomes your profession, then nothing can be better than that, right? Uh, great, great. Thank you, Mr. Wangjo. Thank you for your time uh, for, you know, and for sharing so many interesting stories and insights with us. I'm sure our audience has found these to be very, very relevant and thought-provoking for sure. I have thoroughly enjoyed our discussion today. Um, once again, on behalf of Dell Technologies, would really like to thank you for taking your time out and meeting up with us all the way from Ladakh. Thank you so much, sir. I would just say that uh, in life, you know, get what you like, or like what you get. In both these situations, you will be happy. Otherwise, you will need breaks and weekends and hobbies. So enjoy your lives, like what you have got, or get what you like. Don't waste your life. It's short. It's only one. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sonam Wangchuk and Ms. Ruthu Gupta. That conversation brought out such immersive insights and gems of wisdom. I'm sure all the insights will be invaluable to each of us in multiple ways. Thank you very much for making us rethink how technology can help us make the world a better place to live in. Not just for humans, but for all forms of life. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the conclusion of today's episode. And I hope you found the Boardroom Unplugged 2.0 informative and useful. 
I would request you to please take a few moments of your time to fill in the feedback form. We would love to hear your feedback or suggestions. Your feedback helps us enhance the content, structure, and delivery of our conferences. Also, ladies and gentlemen, the conference platform remains available now for you to navigate across to the Expo Hall, Resource Center, Networking Lounge, and chat with experts as the exhibit board. We thank you all once again for joining us today at the Boardroom Unplug 2.0 on behalf of Dell Technologies, Intel, SISL, VMware, and Strategy. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great day ahead.